The reason we're doing this is because, as you know, it's an election year. Primaries have opened up. I did my, my voting yesterday. I hope everyone is considering that. These are going to be coming up in November, so we need to be educated about them. And I got to hear Sharon speak. Uh, a couple weeks ago, and I was really impressed, and I said, I have to get you on the schedule now because I'm sure she's going to be very busy going all around the area talking to people. I'm also going to be handing out kind of a cheat sheet that you can take with you uh, mm -hmm. so that you can remember, and I got this from uh, ballotpedia.org, which is on here, so if you want more information, you can also find it there, and Sharon's going to talk more about that, and without further ado, Sharon. Hi, I'm Sharon Lynn. I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of Seminole County. How many people here are from Seminole? Wow. Okay. So I don't feel like quite as much of an interloper coming into Winter Park. Then. <laughs> and I'd like to thank Jocelyn for inviting me. She was at my very first amendments presentation, so I told her she was the canary in the mine. <laughs> and... Uh, Hence her handing this out because one of the things we found was that as we're going through this there may be times when you want to make a note and not want to have to rely on your memory uh, when you get your sample ballot or your vote by mail ballot in early October. Okay, what would a League of Women Voters presentation be without us touting the League of Women Voters? We are a nonpartisan, political, nonprofit organization. We were established in 1920, so we're coming up on our 100th anniversary. And that was when women got the vote, by the way. And we started accepting men in the league in 1972. So everybody is welcome. We serve voters and promote good governance. We Research, educate, and advocate. And why is that important? Well, we're kind of a split mission organization. <laughs> Our education arm is um, completely nonpartisan. Our advocacy arm comes from studying a position and coming to a consensus with the various leagues. And right now there are, I believe, 29 leagues in Florida. So that that's one of our important components. Okay, what will be on your ballot? Well, obviously the governor and the cabinet, one Senate seat, all House of Representatives, and excuse me if I sit down and get up, I, I have a challenged leg, so I hope that doesn't screw up the camera work that I was trying so hard to stay out of. <laughs> Uh, state senators, some are up for election in 2018, and Seminole County, I know, we're, we're not having a state senate election until 2020. And of course we have many local, county, and municipal uh, races going on, and, but the reason I'm here today is to uh, talk about the 13 constitutional amendments that will appear on the November ballot. Now, probably some of you know that that's down to 12 now. How many of you knew that? Yes, the, the Greyhound ban amendment got struck by the court. I think there is still a chance it may come back, but I think it's unlikely. So, as I think you probably all know, we have 40 state senators and 120 House reps. And I know that the ballot in November will include uh, soil and water conservation district candidates as well. And because this is relatively informal, if you have any questions, just raise your hand and Jocelyn will come around to you because, you know, sometimes it's easier to ask while it's on your mind than to remember something a half an hour later that you, you know, wish you. Let's put it this way. I forget my questions within about five seconds. <laughs> So the Constitutional Committee meets once every 20 years. I mean, the, the, the world changes much more than every 20 years, as, as do the needs of Florida. What would it take for them to 
change that to five years or 10 years? Well, uh, 20 it's, years is ridiculous. it's kind of interesting because not, not too many states even have a, a Constitution <laughs> Review Commission. And let's, since you brought it up, let's, let's talk about um, how amendments get on the ballot. Oops. I think I'm missing a slide here. All right. Well, I'm going to talk about how amendments get on the ballot, even though the slide's not there. And you can't stop me. <laughs> Okay, amendments can be proposed by the legislature, and to do that it requires three-fifths approval by both chambers. And as I think we're probably all familiar with, in Florida we can have citizens initiatives, and that requires getting signed petitions from the equivalent of 8% of the number of voters who participated in the last presidential election. So for Florida right now, that's over 750,000 petition signatures that you have to gather to get a citizen's initiative on the ballot. Not only do you have to get those, they have to be verified by the supervisor of elections of the various counties, and they have to span a number of congressional districts. So it's, it's not an easy task. It's expensive. Um, the league participated in... Uh, in 2014, the Water and Land Legacy Amendment, and that I think ended up, I, I think it, it cost millions basically to to run a citizens' initiative campaign to get an amendment on the ballot. I, I have a question. So when they were they went around for this constitutional amendment every 20 years, and they had these big town hall meetings across the state. Did everybody get heard, and and how did those meetings get run? Just to give us a little bit of a picture on that? Well, they, they were not widely publicized, um, and where they were, they sometimes had crowds that couldn't entirely be accommodated, and um, of course I'm nonpartisan, but let me explain to you how the uh, Revision Commission is formed. Uh, the governor gets to appoint 15 people. The Speaker of the House gets to appoint nine people. The Senate President gets to appoint nine people. The Attorney General is already, is, is automatically on the commission. So now you've taken up uh, 34 of the 37 com commission members by appointment. And then the Supreme Court gets to pick three people. And in past commissions, that has resulted in a broader spectrum of thinking. But um, again, I'm nonpartisan, but you only have to look at this and see that, um, well, that, that, that the cabinet, uh, that, that it's controlled uh, exclusively by uh, one party at this point. What's the other thing about this uh, Constitution Revision Commission that's different? When you do an amendment either legislatively or through citizens' initiatives, it has to deal with a single issue. It has to be brief and clear. And it has to be run by the Supreme Court before it can be on the ballot for them to assure that those conditions are met. Um, as a difference, the Constitution Revision Commission does not have to adhere to those standards which is why you're seeing multiple issues in one amendment and why they can ramble on and they were not reviewed by the Supreme Court. Are there any questions that I may or may not be able to answer? <laughs> the same percentage to, uh, uh, to yes or no as the regular? Yes, they, they all require 60% to pass, and, um, you know, we'll see. And right now, I think we're all aware that uh, eight, well, now seven of the amendments are from the Constitution Revision Commission to our citizens' initiatives, and three are from the state legislature. And I think one of the things that, when I see amendments that, that always uh, kind of sticks in my head is that once it's in the Constitution, it's more or less cast in concrete. 
And I think there are times when certainly issues I've been involved in, you've been like, well, why can't you just get this done legislatively? Well, I think what happens is when you can't, then the citizens resort to, to this mechanism to get things on the books, so to speak. But as I said, that is an issue that once they're in the Constitution, it's very difficult to change except for every 20 years. And <clears throat> we are, I, I think we're the only state that has a review commission like this. That's correct. Okay, Amendment 1. Increased homestead property tax exemption. And this one was proposed by the Florida legislature. It would increase homestead exemption by $25,000 for homes valued at more than 100000 A vote yes would, of course, amount to a loss of tax revenue. A vote no would retain the current exemption. Now, uh, the Florida Association of Counties estimates an annual loss to Florida of about $687,000 million annually uh, if, if this amendment were to pass. And it does exempt school districts, but of course the question remains how would potential shortfalls be addressed? So it's, those are the things to think about. I have a question. Wait, we have a question. Whenever I see amendments like this, I say, well, we'll just make it up by increasing the tax rate. What do you think about that? Well, I think it depends on a, a lot on your county because so many people uh, run on no new taxes, but it has to come from somewhere or you diminish services. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know that I can really answer that question, but yeah, somebody's got to pay for it. Um, and this to me appears to be a bit regressive because really it, it only helps people who are able to own homes. But, and that's not the league's opinion, that's mine. What is the league's opinion on these amendments? Can you give that? Yes, yeah, actually, boy, you guys are good. <laughs> I, I almost would think you're clairvoyant. <laughs> okay, uh, opposing organizations. Uh, since there are no supporting organizations for this particular amendment, let's go to the opposing. Uh, League of Women Voters, Florida Policy Institute, Florida League of Cities, Progress Florida, and the Florida Education Association. And because this presentation is education and not advocacy, if anybody wants to know the reasons for a league position, I'll be happy to talk about it outside after we're finished. Okay, Amendment 2, and this again was proposed by the state legislature. And, and it is proposing a limitation on property tax assessments, making permanent a 10% cap on non-homestead assessments. A vote yes would keep the 10% cap and disallow tax revenue for rising property values. A vote no would end tax limits on non-homestead property and possibly increase taxes for schools. So that's fairly self-explanatory. Um, the state uh, revenue estimating conference estimates a loss of tax revenue of about $700 million annually if this were to pass. Question? Uh, yes. Why is it only possibly increased taxes? Mm -hmm. what, what's the variable that would say it does, it does not increase taxes for schools? Mm -hmm. Do you know? I don't know. Okay. I, I think it's the different the dollar amount. Well, yeah, it's about. the way the tax bills are composed, That's basically. Right. It's not the, uh, it, it's the, the, the dollar amount that they're talking about. They know it will increase, but that's their estimate of 700 million. It could be 300 million, it could be 500 million. But I think it's because the education on your tax bill is sort of right. separately set out. Right. So that, for instance, like I think Save Our Homes or can, can exclude an increase in uh, school taxes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, here, here. What is the uh, use of 
of the legislature to put these to judges. The question was, what is the reason that the legislature is proposing these two amendments? It sounds like they want to talk about how they lower taxes, which is a big selling point. For the questioner suggests it sounds like they may want to just appear to have lowered taxes. Um, I don't know, but that's, yeah, I, I think they're, and again, this is me speaking, this is not the league speaking, but they, they sort of sound like feel-good things for certain parts of our, anyway. <laughs> um, is this the 10% increase that you were talking about? I don't think so. so I, 10 percent ever. I mean, it says an annual increase, and I'm not quite sure what that means in this context. No, I, I, and unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that question. But it, a permanent 10 percent cap, I, I don't know. To me, that sounds like once you hit 10 percent, you're there. Yes. Yeah, here. It, it, that way everybody can. Thank you. Uh, it says non-homestead. Uh, right. Only. Uh, that would be what businesses and. Right. Your second home. Right. Yeah, if you have a second, second home, home, exactly. Rental. So people who come down here just for the winter or something like that. Um, and you know, I'd like to point out that Jocelyn didn't tell me that you guys were going to have you know really good questions. <laughs> No dummies in this room. No, I kind of come to that conclusion. So, supporting organizations. <laughs> well, look at number one. Uh, Florida Association of Realtors. Uh, opposing organizations, the League of Women Voters of Florida, and the Florida Education Association. Bunch of ringers. <laughs> okay, Amendment 3. Uh, this is a citizen's initiative, and it's regarding voter control of gambling in Florida. And I'm curious, did anybody read the Scott Maxwell yes. column on this this yeah. week? Yeah, because I thought that was pretty interesting. Yes. They opened the door. <laughs> yes. This amendment would require a constitutional amendment to approve any new casino gambling. A vote yes would require the voters to approve a citizen's initiative to authorize any casino gambling in Florida. A vote no would continue to allow casino gambling to be approved by the legislature. And the source of the proposed initiative is citizen initiative, uh, I'm sorry, that makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, this would prevent the state legislature from making decisions about gambling in any community and only the voters would be able to decide. A uh, yes vote would preclude legislative proposals to add casino gambling. The legislature could approve other gambling such as poker rooms, bingo, and fantasy sports. A no vote would allow the legislature to make these decisions for local communities. When they're talking about the voters, I mean within a, within a county or statewide? State statewide. Statewide. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Well, the the article from Scott Maxwell again. This is aside from this presentation completely. Yeah. Was just casting a light on the fact that. Um, it's backed by. Well, it's backed by the the Walt Disney, Walt Disney uh, World and as and um, I, I don't know if it's just a Seminole tribe, Seminole but anybody. Tribe. Walt Disney and, 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 uh, like down in Hollywood where they have the, where they have the, the, right, where they have the casino that's run by, yeah. So, so that was the, the thrust of the Scott Maxwell column was questioning the, um, intent of this. Supporting organizations, voters in charge, Disney, Worldwide Services, Seminole Tribe of Florida, No Casinos, and League of Women Voters. Opposing Organizations, Florida Education Association. 
On what grounds is the league supporting it? Like I said, if you, I will answer that because I'm trying to stick to our education and not advocacy, although I'm not doing an entirely effective job of that. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay, Amendment 4. Voting rights restoration, which I think we're all aware was a citizen's initiative. It would restore the eligibility to vote to persons with felony convictions who have completed their sentences. And this excludes um, violent former felons. A vote yes would grant those persons who have completed their sentences the ability to register to vote. And this is just about voting, by the way. Except those convicted of murder or sex offenses. A vote no would continue to make those who have completed their sentences wait a minimum of five years before applying to the governor and the cabinet. And I assume everybody knows here that it is up to the governor and the cabinet to, to restore rights. And we collected, verified over 766,200 petitions as a state to get this on the ballot. In 2011, Governor Scott, with the consent of his cabinet, issued new rules resulting in only 3,000 restored rights out of 30,000 pending applications. Okay, supporting organizations, Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, Floridians for a Fair Democracy, the ACLU, League of Women Voters of Florida, Progress Florida, Florida Policy Institute, and the Florida National Organization of Women and the opposing organizations, Floridians for a Sensible Voting Rights Policy. You guys are telling me. Okay, Amendment 5, and this one is another one from the state legislature. And this requires a supermajority vote to impose, authorize, or raise state taxes or fees. A vote yes requires two-thirds Senate and House votes a supermajority to raise any taxes or fees. A vote no allows the legislature to continue to approve increases in taxes and fees with a simple majority and to bundle tax bills with other measures. Uh, no brain. Yeah. <laughs> One of the concerns that has been raised about this is that in the event of an emergency, it would make it very difficult to, um, to, to find money. And the same provision was actually on the ballot in 2012, known as Tabor Taxpayers' Bill of Rights, and it was defeated. Supporting organizations, Florida Tax Watch. Opposing organizations, the League of Women Voters, Florida Policy Institute, Progress Florida, and the Florida Education Association. Okay, and now we get to Amendment 6 through, frankly, at this point, 12. And, uh, each of these contain multiple parts bundled into single yes-no proposals. So we'll try to concentrate on the most important elements of these amendments. And just in, in my, uh, in my, to my way of thinking, I'm, if I'm looking at them and there's one I just can't live with, you know, you know, if you've got two good, one bad, or two bad, one good, you, you have to do some thinking because it's, it's just. Uh, fairly muddying of the waters. So, Amendment 6, Rights of Crime Victims and Judges. It expands victims' rights, many of which are state law, while limiting time for an accused to file appeals. Yes. We don't have that. It's not on there, there's six on the document. You don't have it on the document? No, it's not on the document. Okay. I know nothing. 
<laughs> that wrote that was from uh, it, it, it would be my fault I guess I dropped it when I was creating this I was trying to get it all into one page sorry so number six has been dropped so you'll need to make notes with a pen yes. oh. this, this this means that you know as though you weren't already paying attention to the questions I'm pretty sure you are in any event, this expands victims' rights, uh, many of which are in state law, while limiting time for an accused to file appeals. It eliminates an existing constitutional provision that victims' rights do not interfere with the constitutional rights of the accused. It raises the retirement age of judges from 70 to 75. And it prohibits courts and judges from deferring to state agencies' interpretation of statutes and rules. Question. Yes. The, oh, thank you. Thank you. The first part says it expands victims' rights, and the second part says it eliminates the an existing provision that victims' rights do not. Is, does that make any sense? Well, and, and here's where the, the, the commission being held to a different standard, the clarity is not run by the Supreme Court, so that's part of it. But the first part um, basically is expanding victims' rights, and the second part is eliminating uh, a provision that victims' rights do not interfere. So it's actually a little consistent, basically. If you, if you turn the sentence around, the second part says that victims' rights uh, are, are, are um, that the accused having their rights uh, eliminated uh, is, anyway, it's, it's a terrible way of writing it, but it's kind of saying the same thing. Well, I, I also have a question. I mean, we're talking about victims' rights there at the beginning, and then we go down to talk about judges. Why? Why are they putting two so dissimilar topics on? One well, and that's, and I think we'll find that as we go through this, and and that has been one of the problems. Um, I know I was trying to follow this early on, and at one point they had uh, a potential two thousand suggested amendments, which they kind of pared down to a hundred and three, and some of the good ones, well. Some of the ones that I would agree with didn't make it, and um, I don't understand why they bundled them. It, it, it uh, yeah. I mean, I think it makes it very difficult for anybody to take a single amendment and not have some source of doubt about it. Yes. Yes, because I yeah. Anyway. And the, the victim's rights is, is uh, in response to Marcy's law, and I, that was that young lady that was murder, murdered by her ex-boyfriend when he was released on bail, and she was never notified. So the important aspects of this amendment, um, the retirement age for judges doesn't impact those currently on the bench. Uh, the Constitution already covers victim's rights, and there have been, in certain areas, concern expressed the rights of defendants, uh, especially relating to their rights for an appeal. A yes vote. A yes vote would enshrine more victims' rights in the Constitution while eliminating an existing provision for the rights of the accused, raise the mandatory retirement age for a judge, and force judges to decide if the state agency correctly interpreted the law. And, and if anybody can come up with a way to explain that, I'd be happy to, to hear that last part. A vote no would retain existing victims' rights in the Constitution and not set a deadline for appeals. It would keep judges' retirement age at 70 and continue to allow state agencies' interpretation of state laws. So, really, um, it increases the protection uh, from disclosure of victims' information, and it allows more victim input and access to pre-sentencing pre investigations, sentencing or pre-trial release proceedings, and sentencing reports. It would set deadlines to complete any state appeals to two years for a non-capital case and five years for a capital case. So.
supporting organizations, the Florida Sheriffs, and Florida Smart Justice. The opposing organizations, ACLU, don't you always want to follow the money? Um, League of Women Voters of Florida and Florida Education Association. And who else wishes we didn't live on the I-4 corridor and <laughs> with political ads? I, I was talking to a friend from Tallahassee and I'm talking about the ads. She's like, no, oh, we're not seeing any of those. I'm not moving to Tallahassee. But. All right, Amendment 7, another uh, CRC amendment. <clears throat> And this would provide first responder and military member survivors benefits. Uh, it refers to public colleges and universities, creates mandatory death benefits to surviving spouses of first re responders and military members, and requires supermajority vote to raise or impose fees, and establishes a state college system as a constitutional entity. What? What? Yeah. Okay. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I, I guess th this would limit m money for our universities by allowing, it, if you're looking at it as a balance, it, it looks like you'd be uh, perhaps limiting uh, money for the universities by allowing benefits for military and requiring a supermajority for increased student fees. So is it just a simple majority now? <clears throat> yes. And this also establishes the state college system as a constitutional entity. Um, and I guess that's for all the community colleges that turned into state colleges. A vote yes would force supermajority vote for university fee increases, would add a framework for state colleges in the Constitution, and would require the state to pay death benefits to U.S. military residents or those stationed in Florida. A vote no would continue allowing majority vote for fee increases, exclude a framework for state colleges in the Constitution, and continue providing death benefits for first responders through state law. Is there anything here that anybody wants to ask about? Yes, why would they be putting state colleges in the Constitution? What's the purpose? I have no idea. I, r I really have no idea. That's the thing with these amendments, I'm not even sure, and, and I have looked into to to some of it to, to try to figure out how these things came up as being important. So, so that that's an I don't know. So comment, um, one, I guess, possibility is because the state universities are in the Constitution, they're allowed to put all kinds of very specific policy changes on them, uh, including things like performance-based funding, and I would imagine that adding the state colleges to the Constitution would allow them to require the same kinds of restrictions or changes to those institutions. And, and, and that's that would guess. make sense. Mm. All right. Yeah. Supporting organizations, Association of Florida Colleges. Opposing organizations, League of Women Voters of Florida and the Florida Education Association. And again, part of the issue, and, and, and you know, uh, I've seen people say, oh, I'm just going to vote no on everything. Well, I mean, you're, I really think you have to consider each, each one separately. And, you know, if, if there's no part of it that disturbs you, that's, that's fine. <laughs> we have a question back here. Yes. Uh, why would why would the I'm sorry. Why would the association of the colleges want um, a super majority rather than a make simple majority for increasing fees? I don't know. It's a, it's a it's puzzling to me. Um, it might be because they do want to have more parity in how they're treated with the universities. Okay, Amendment 8. There is a pending lawsuit on this based on uh, 
the ability to authorize charter schools while bypassing county school boards. So here's, but this is what the amendment's about. It, it uh, creates eight-year term limits for school board members uh, regarding public schools. It allows the state legislature to set up a state-run system for establishing and operating public schools, which of course includes charter schools, and creates a constitutional requirement for civics education in public schools, something already required by state law. So, <laughs> We will see how the lawsuit goes. Um, it just appears to be an attack on home rule. Who is suing? Talk to you about that later. <laughs> okay, a vote yes would establish term limits for school board members, would permit the legislature to establish state-run public schools, and would put in the Constitution man mandatory civics classes. A vote no would reject term limits, would keep local school boards the sole authority for approving and supervising public schools, and a no vote would also reject a constitutional mandate for something already required by law. And uh, again, <laughs> the, the local school boards elected by their local communities currently can do what they're suggesting that the state legislature do. And of course, as I said, I think part of it's because charter schools are considered public schools. Okay. Supporting organizations, U.S. term limits, <laughs> Opposing organizations, Florida School Boards Association, League of Women Voters, Florida Policy Institute, Florida Education Association, and the Florida National Organization of Women. And I, I have a note here that was in the presentation that U.S. Term Limits is a non-profit, non-partisan grassroots organization dedicated to enacting term limits for elected officials at every level of government in the United States. Making it a family business. <laughs> <laughs> All right, nine. Prohibits offshore and gas drilling, prohibits vaping in enclosed indoor workspaces. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, of course offshore drilling is of great concern to voters, especially since we have seen what can happen, um, and we do have constitutional prohibitions about smoking in workplaces currently. Uh, <clears throat> about yes would enshrine in the Constitution a ban on offshore and gas drilling signal Florida's opposition to offshore drilling and add vaping restrictions to the Constitution. <laughs> One of these things, anyway. It's not like the other. A vote no would keep a drilling ban out of the Constitution. I'm not sure that, I think number two is a bit strongly stated, but signal to Florida government, federal government that Florida doesn't care about offshore drilling. And keep vaping out of the Constitution. So, I guess you have to weigh how you feel about offshore drilling and, and you know, the vaping issue. I thought I had a problem with my drill. Uh, I thought we had already voted in Florida about offshore drilling, and it was a no. Well, I think this would would put it in the Constitution um, anyway, because I don't think that there is a, a, constitu a constitutional provision prohibiting drilling. And if somebody knows differently, I'd be happy to hear, because I don't know it can anything. Keep coming up. There is nothing that can keep coming up. 
Okay, supporting organizations, Florida Wildlife Federation, Golf Restoration Network, American Cancer Association, Cancer Action Network, League of Women Voters of Florida, Florida Paul Institute, and Progress Florida. The opposing organizations, <laughs> the Florida Petroleum Council, Associate Industries of Florida. Does, it, does everybody know who runs Associated Industries? Okay. I think it's, isn't it Tom Bean? Or is that a different one? Anyway, the Florida Chamber of Commerce supports it and Consumers for Smoke Free Alternatives. We have a question. Yes. I have a question. So where it says that you can't vape in um, enclosed areas or in like public spaces, what I'm wondering is if somebody needs it for medicinal purposes, if there's an exception for that, um, or if it's all vaping. I don't know, and and um, I don't know, but I think it's another one where you know by bundling them, it, it it's yeah. Okay. On to number ten. You guys are hanging in there. I'm so impressed. This is this is a good group. I I agree. I believed it beforehand. I know it now. Okay, Amendment 10, and this is another one. Well, well, we'll just go through what it's about. State and local government structure and operation. It would require the legislature in even years, which are election years, to start sessions in January, which is pretty much what's already happening. You know, in a year like this, where the legislature's going to meet in an odd year after an election, it has to be postponed to March, because until after November, we don't even know who our representatives are going to be and they have to have committee meetings and all kinds of things in advance of the session. So uh, anyway, that's number one. Two, creates Office of Domestic Security and Counterterrorism. Mandates existence of State Department of Veterans <laughs> Affairs. And forces all counties to elect and never abolish uh, election of sheriff, tax collector, property appraiser, supervisor of election and clerk of county court. Now, this is being challenged, at least now, and maybe maybe something else has happened since, since I looked at this, but uh, there's a lawsuit by Miami-Dade for the fourth item, and uh, that's because um, we're, we're a charter county in Seminole County, we're a charter crook county in Orange, Osceola's a charter county, Miami-Dade's a charter county, and charter counties basically have their own sort of county constitutions, for lack of a better uh, explanation. And so Miami-Dade is fighting this because they do um, appoint some of these positions. So, again, um, you know, everybody locally believes in home rule. Um, and then, when I guess, when you're in Tallahassee, that's not as easy to, to, to be in favor of. And if you're in Tallahassee, you're against federal interference, and so it goes. So, a yes vote would fix the date of legislative se sessions and even years. It would create an Office of Domestic Security and Counterterrorism, and that's a function that I believe is already being done by FDLE. It would force the legislature to have a Department of Veterans Affairs, and would force all Florida counties to elect constitutional officers. And again, I see that as a sort of a, a home rule issue, and we'll see how the, how the lawsuit pans out. So it might disappear, I guess is my point. So it's Miami, that's yeah, Miami-Dade. A vote no would continue to allow legislative session date, the legislature to set the dates, but they're pretty much setting them in January regardless when it's not post-election. It would reject mandatory mandated Office of Security and Counterterrorism. A no vote would reject mandated Department of Veterans Affairs. And a no vote would allow Florida's charter counties to continue determining how the duties of the five county offices will be arranged.
supporting organizations. <laughs> and the opposing organizations, Florida League of Women Voters and the Florida Education Association. That, that amendment is another one brought to us by the Constitution Revision Commission. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Amendment 11, property rights, <clears throat> removal of obsolete provision and criminal statutes. This repeals the state's ability to prohibit non-citizens from buying, owning, and selling property. It deletes a provision that forces the state to prosecute criminal suspects under a law they were charged under, even if the law is repealed. And it deletes obsolete high-speed rail language from the Constitution. <laughs> Go back to horse and buggy. Well, there's that option. <laughs> Would it reduce our carbon footprint? <laughs> okay, and, and, and one of the things is that um, the, the, the first part about it is it's, it's not something that's really been enforceable regardless. Uh, and the law would ensure that criminals are prosecuted under the most current laws on the books. A vote yes would repeal the legislature's right to restrict property rights of non-citizens. It would delete requirements to pr prosecute criminal suspects for laws that have been changed since the crime was committed. And again, delete the, the high-speed high rail. A vote no would continue to have a law that restricts property rights of non-citizens, continue to allow criminal suspects to be prosecuted under repealed laws, and would retain high-speed rail in the Constitution. What does the Constitution require with regards to high-speed rail? What does it currently require in the Constitution? <laughs> I don't I mean, know. <laughs> I don't remember. I should, because I've lived here long enough to know that. Well, because the government was willing to pay, help us to have a oh, yeah. rail. Yes, and it went to another state because, yeah. yeah. Right. And it worked fine for them. And now we're talking about a high-speed rail system between Tampa and Miami that we are going to allow private people right. to right. So what we're seeing here again is this nature. I personally feel that a, a good transportation system is it's the job of the federal government because we need good <laughs> She's saying that she feels that the transportation system is more the job of the federal government and that we need uh, them to provide the country with decent and we needed that high speed rail between here and Tampa and, and so the only reason they say no is uh, I don't know why they say no be, it's, it was to their benefit, and now they wanted to give it to private industry, which will be, again, to some people's benefit, not to the people, no. not to the pe ordinary people, but to someone who is going to be in charge of building that. That's, uh, it's like, you know, Florida, please. Yes, please. You know, I'm going to Well, there have been some, I'm sure you, 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 you people, uh, <laughs> I, I assume to be article readers, and there have been some articles recently about, you know, who's investing in what, but I will <laughs> let you know. It's pretty evident that if you read the paper, who's the person that's investing in that. No, his wife. His wife. What's hers is his. Hers is his. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, supporting organizations. None at this time. And opposing organizations, the Florida Education Association. Where does the League of Women Voters stand? They have not taken a position on this one. Tell us how you feel. I will. Okay. Amendment 12, lobbying and abuse of office by public 
officers. So what else is new? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. So what else is new? So what so else is new? Can how they do that? <laughs> <laughs> it expands restrictions on paid lobbying by former public officers. It creates restrictions on paid lobbying by currently serving public officers and prohibits certain abuses of public office. So what it would do is it would expand from two to six years the time that uh, many officials would have to wait after leaving office before they could start lobbying. Unless you catch them. Unless you catch them. And it expands the range of government agencies that a sitting legislator may not lobby to include not only the state government, also federal and local governments. And the prohibition would include statewide office holders such as cabinet members. Amendment 12 also includes a new prohibition against office holders and public employees using their positions to gain a disproportionate benefit for themselves and their families. A vote yes would extend the ban on state lobbying. We just went through that. Um, would prohibit legislators and statewide elected officials from lobbying federal and local governments. Uh, a no vote would keep in place the current two-year ban. Supporting organizations, Integrity Florida, Common Cause, and Florida Policy Institutes. Opposing organizations, the Florida Education Association. And again, the League has taken no position on this. Um, And those decisions are, are, I believe, made by the by the state board, and they may still be working on things, but we'll see where things end up. Now, okay, I'm going. I think we have a question here. Yes. I just wanted to get some more clarification on what they mean by um, legislatures lobbying federal agencies. Does that mean like Florida senators couldn't go to the EPA and say, "Here's an issue Florida is facing. Let me tell you about the problems." Well, they couldn't do it for money after leaving office for lobbying. For lobbying. Right, but the one that said current. No, they can do it when they're current. Well, and, and if they do it currently as part of their job, they wouldn't be lobbying because it wouldn't. They wouldn't be getting compensated for that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're down to the last five minutes. All right, and we're skipping 13 because it's not on for any, this is just a little pitch that if anybody, I can't imagine anybody in this room not being registered to vote. We, we also have voter registration here at our meetings. So. Yay. Yes. And, of course, there are three ways to vote. If you haven't already voted, vote by mail, or early voting, and, of course, at your precinct on election day. And... Thank you so much. What a great group. I think from now on they should be my canaries in the morning. <laughs> of course, we'd like to have you come every season.